All right. Very good. Feel good? Yeah, I feel good. Are you nervous? Um, do you get nervous, Bill? I want to do a good job. <laughs> <laughs> what does that feel like when you want to do a good job in your body? Do you get like a tummy ache? Like you get like like tightness in your chest? That's how I feel when I'm nervous. Yeah, I get adrenaline. Adrenaline. Mm-hmm. So are you like jacked on adrenaline right now? I have a, I have a healthy level of energy going. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Welcome to Working Class Hollywood, conversations with people that make the movies, TV shows, and entertainment you love. If you're looking to break into or move up in the entertainment industry, or you're just a fan of content and want to hear about how it's made, this is the podcast for you. I'm your host, Jeremiah Smith. Everybody and welcome to Working Class Hollywood. Today's episode is a very, very special one. I sat down with Vanderpump Rules executive producer and showrunner Bill Langworthy. Bill is one of the most intelligent people I have ever met. He is one of the best showrunners in all of television, and I've had the pleasure of working with him for the last seven years. Bill agreed to sit down with me for this podcast, and I got to ask him about how he got started in entertainment his experience working on The Hills and The City, how we got the job at Evolution with Vanderpump Rules, and then we get into some really good behind the scenes of just how we make Vanderpump Rules. I reached out to the cast of Vanderpump Rules as well as some of the producers, let them know I was interviewing Bill, and they sent in some questions, so you'll hear me ask questions from Stasi and Ariana and Tom Sandoval. Bill and I had a very interesting conversation, and I think you're going to enjoy it. Before I play it for you, I do just want to ask you one favor. Maybe you are dipping into this podcast for the first time. Maybe you have listened to a few episodes and haven't gotten around to it, but I'm going to ask you to please go onto iTunes, Spotify, wherever you're listening, subscribe to the podcast, rate the podcast, fill in those empty stars, tell me what you think, and write a review. It is so helpful and will help get this podcast into the ears of more people that will enjoy these interviews. Okay, without further ado, enjoy my interview with Vanderpump Rules showrunner, Bill Langworth. All right, Bill. I always start the same way. Where are you from? How'd you end up in Los Angeles? I was born in New York City, and I grew up for most of my childhood in a town called West Newbury, Massachusetts. 3,000 people. I did not know anyone who had ever known anyone who worked in entertainment in any way. And it was all I ever wanted to do. Why? When, like, from what age did you kind of realize that? I feel like every kid loves movie and TV shows, but I can tell you, for me, it was different. I just lost my mind at great shows or amazing movies. I'd play them over and over in my head. There was, we were into a lot of things, everything that kids do, but... I had one friend who had a video camera and would go over and make little movies or, you know, little, little shows. And there was just nothing that was ever as fun as that. Yeah. We would just lose ourselves in it. Just, you know, hours flying by. And it was, um, there was just one of those things of just like, I can't imagine what else I would do that would be nearly as fun as this. But did you know that that was a job at that point. Cause like when I was a kid, I, I same thing. Like I loved TV and movies. Like I had a subscription to entertainment weekly when I was like 11 years old, my friends and I made movies on VHS tapes and stuff, but like, I never like con- never occurred to me that that was a profession. Like, how did you, that's funny. Cause I hear people say that and it was different for me. I always knew, of course it was a profession. Of course someone was making it. Of course someone was doing that. I just thought that it was more of a secret club and you needed to know the handshake and the people were probably completely different and they spoke different and they, they looked different. And so maybe it was just outside of the realm of possibility. Like you, you knew it existed. You just didn't know that you could do it. And I was like, it, exactly. Yeah. And I, and that's what 
honestly, I love so much about what you're doing here is that you just get to hear from people that they're just regular people who really wanted to do something and were willing to make a few sacrifices and stick with it. And now they're doing it. That, that, that is exactly what I'm doing. And it's like, like, no matter, like the more people I meet and like, no matter what industry they work in, like, I just, I think that everyone, we're all just people, people who need people and like, we're all just struggling to get by. And so it's just like, yeah, it, I want, I want this industry to like be relatable to people and feel accessible to people because it is right. Like anyone could do it. Anyone could do, could come and start working in LA for the most part. Did you think? Yeah, you just have to be very willing to give up some other things. It comes. It comes with sacrifice. Sure. Yeah, I think most I've, I've, a lot of industries probably do. But so, how did you go from a boy, young boy, in Massachusetts, <laughs> TV and movie obsessed? Like, where, what, where did you go? Like, what, what was your path? So, my favorite show of all time as a kid was Late Night with David Letterman, and then uh-huh. the Late Show with David Letterman. I used to, you know. In, seventh grade staying up till one thirty in the morning watching letterman and one time i remember because you know he would mess around with his crew and his staff and stuff uh-huh. so he had an intern on and the intern looked kind of just like a guy like a guy like me honestly like like guy that i would be you know in, in 10 years and i just thought like that is unbelievable that you know it's probably some kid from a liberal arts school you know in maine or something like that that was working for David Letterman. And I was like, I am going to do that. And so for me, that was like the one thing I could imagine that I could apply for, that there was a path, that there were steps I could take. So when I went to college, I studied really hard and made sure that I had, you know, a transcript I could be proud of. And I applied for the internship at Letterman and I got it. And it was the biggest deal in the world. It was like getting into the space program. I just could not even believe it. And so then, you know, I'm still an undergraduate living in New York City. Where'd you go to college? Cornell. Cornell. And that's in New York. It's in upstate New York. Upstate New York. Okay. Yeah. So then uh, just spent like an unbelievable summer. Yeah, I couldn't even drink. I was, I guess I was 20 years old. And, uh, you know, just my working on Broadway in New York City for David Letterman. And, you know, I had never taken anything as seriously before in my life (laughs) um there's a one of my favorite pieces of uh information about you is that you you like produced like the stupid human tricks or stupid pet tricks for letterman was that as an intern no no so that was afterwards they they hired me back okay yeah so did you go from the like from the internship straight on to the job or did you have to go back to school and finish no so i went back to school and finished then when I graduated, there weren't any jobs at Letterman. They weren't hiring. And it, it's, a, it's tough. At the time, there were not many shows in New York City at all. And some of the people who were working for Dave had been there for 23 years. Yeah. So, you know, it was a log jam. But I, the, I got really lucky that um, a woman on my floor freshman year, her mom was the executive producer of the Ricky Lake show. Do you remember the Ricky Lake I show? I do, yeah. So... Uh, She was nice enough to say, you know, if you want to be a PA on that show, uh, we could do it. And I really, I didn't know if that was something I wanted to do. And I would never really seen the show and, you know, daytime talk just did not seem like my thing. And, um, I ended up doing it and it was the greatest. It was an unbelievable experience. The executive producer with this woman, uh, Gail Steinberg, who was classy and professional and just in control, such a great person to learn from that when you do that show, you do it. It's really almost a different show every single week. So one week it could be like a freak show, dating show. Mm -hmm. The next week it could be too fat to be a drag queen. (laughs) The next week it could be a show where you're trying to get guys to tell their wife about their secret gay lovers for the first time on TV and I was doing all of that. And, you know, if, if you might think, you know, <laughs> I'm a little buttoned down today, but imagine me when I'm 21 and just graduated from school and I'm on the phone with these people just saying like, I think it'd be a great idea for you to come out 
on national television in front of your <laughs> wife and explaining, you know, explain all these things to them. But, you know, we, the, the pace was so fast, very little room for error. It was almost like you're doing a live show. The minute you finished, you're on to the next one. Mm-hmm. And it, it was nine months and it feels like five years in terms of like how vividly I remember it, you know, every, every single day. Um, but it's, it sounds like that, that might have been like early boot camp for reality TV producing, like convincing people to, to like tell their stories as like maybe as like embarrassing and shocking as those stories are on TV. Yeah, that was eye opening to sort of see, you know, how things can, can play out. But the, when you were saying early boot camp, the, the strange thing about my career looking back on it was putting people who had never been on TV on TV. Mm-hmm. So then, you know, the next thing I'm at Letterman doing stupid pet and human tricks. And that was unbelievable and just so fun, but also doing human interests. So, you know, you'd find out about a girl who's eight years old who had passed legislation in her town for ice cream trucks to be able to come like service the area or something <laughs> like that. And we'd, you know, fly them to New York or be a guy um, who brought seven dates to the prom and like going to come out now and, and meet Dave. Um, and then, you know, of course, like the, the pet tricks and the human tricks, um, were just epic and, and unbelievable. And the way we did it then, cause this is a while back. So we're not it's talking like pre-internet. about pre-internet pre pre iPhone. Right. So if you want a video, it's not like, Oh yeah, sure. Here record it. I'm going to text it to you right now. You know, people would go, yeah, I think that, you know, my aunt's neighbor's son might have a camera. Um, I could maybe borrow that, you know, and then they'd get there and go, Oh yeah, just, it was out of batteries. Like, it was like a, an opera to try to get someone to put a, a trick on tape. Yeah. So the easier thing would be that I would just travel to these cities. So I'd go to Kansas city, Kansas, and the local CBS affiliate would play these ads saying late show with David Letterman coming to Kansas city, bring out your best stupid pet trick or your stupid human trick. And I would just set up for two days at the station and people would line up and come out one after the other. And it would literally just be like, you know, my pig tap dances and someone else would go, um, I can drink milk and make it come gushing out of my nose. And then someone else would go, you know, I can, I've got a dog that drives a remote control car and a lizard that rides on a remote control car. And, you know, it, the first couple seem hilarious and so absurd and can't believe that this is your job. But like anything after, you know, 15 minutes, it's just a job, you know? So you're just in there, you know, chatting with pig owners and watching people, you know, light their hair on fire. (laughs) That's so funny. I do, I do want to ask you a question, something that came, that, that came to mind. Like, why do you think like people are willing to do that? Like, why do you think that people are willing to go? I mean, I have have my own theories, uh, but like, why do you think people would be willing to go in front of an audience, in front of cameras, share embarrassing things about themselves that people are going to judge them for and then have it broadcast to millions of people and and oftentimes for no money or financial reward, right? So like, like, why? I think that people feel like they're already stars of their own TV show. And so I think that they're just putting their story out there. Um, One thing that is really interesting about the Ricky Lake show was that every once in a while we would do um, like greatest hits, like best of shows. And the idea was it was supposed to be a little easier because you're just going to go through and find your favorite guests, right? We don't need to vet them again. Don't need to book them again. Don't need to find them. You know, just call on that phone number. Come, come on back. The thing that was really interesting, and you got to believe me, a lot of times, whatever their issue or their problem was that they were on the first time had since gone away because they had seen themselves on the show and realized that they were not acting the way that they thought that they were acting. Mm. And so that I thought was like a a positive outcome. Right. But they don't know that before they come on. That's true. That's true. (laughs) Uh, why do you think that people come on TV to do things that, you know, you might otherwise not even share with your closest confidant? I think that we're all a little bit narcissistic, that we like attention, 
you know? And so, uh, and I remember thinking about this a lot when, when, uh, we worked on Housewives of Orange County and someone asked me, why do these women do it? You know, why, why do they, they've got all the money in the world. They don't have to do this for money. Like why are they coming on TV and, you know, opening their lives and fighting with their friends and revealing dirty secrets about their marriage? Like why, you know, but if you think about what, like, some of these women, you know, before the, the, the housewives casting people reached out to them, like think, think about like a, a Shannon Medore, for example, you know, she's, she lives in this giant house married to this guy that, uh, works 20 hours a day. Right. She, you know, she has kids, but they're at school all the time. And, you know, like, she may, and I don't know this about Shannon, I'm just speculating, but just like she may have, you know, just struggle with sort of like a purpose in life, right? Like she's like, I, my kids are old enough, they don't need me every minute of the day, my husband's at work every day. And yeah, she has money and drives nice cars and stuff, but then someone calls and says, hey, Shannon, I'm interested in you. I'm interested in your story. I want to come with professional storytellers and put you on tape. And, you know, I, I think that like, that attention just appeals to something in all of us and not all of us. I mean, there's plenty of people that be like, fuck, no, I'm not going on television. But I think that people just want to feel special and want to like, they like attention and that it's easy to say yes. When someone's like, Hey, can I, you know, can I pay attention to you? Can I have professional storytellers like shoot your life and like shoot you in your house and like put all the funny things you say on TV. It's like, cause I think like you said, everyone thinks that they're, interesting or funny or whatever so that that that's me i think that we like so that that's really well said so that ties back into um something that uh, i had to learn painfully on the job right and so i'll tell you a little story okay and this like really stuck with me for a while because i couldn't understand why we got the outcome that we did but i think i like understand now which job well i don't want to really blow up I don't want her to know I'm talking about her. Okay. Okay. Um, the, uh, so we had, there was, uh, we we're doing a scene, right? We had, um, eight people in the scene. Okay. Um, and so the thing is now, if we didn't know we we're maybe on the ninth person, okay. The ninth person comes, got to hire another audio mixer and another crew, right? Cause we can only have eight microphones on the bag. Okay. Right. So reach out to this person. We say, we, we, Totally up to you. We really don't care. Um, if you want to come, you can totally come. You just got to let us know now. Um, if you don't want to come, you don't have to come. And, and either way, we don't care. Um, only thing you can do, only thing is don't change your mind. Because, you know, if we don't book it, we can't have you. If we book it, we don't want to have a whole crew pay for that day and have you not come. Right? So if you've ever heard a story before, you can probably guess that the person said, um, no, I'm not coming. Fine. We make that decision. Yes, I am. Right. And I was just like, oh my God. Like you literally, we said we didn't care. Right. You could do whatever you want except this. And now you did it. Right. Now, what I realized later was what we were saying to them was not, you have free will, total agency. You you have the power to do whatever you want. What we were telling them is, we don't care, mm-hmm. right? So now, similar thing, right? All of a sudden now, they're getting like very impassioned phone calls from important people, right? They're getting called into meetings with like the top guys, right? <laughs> I, that, think I, I think I know who this is. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like now, like, I, I guess they do care, right? They must yeah. be. Yeah. This is like, this is kind of better than being in a boring scene even, right? Yeah. Um, and... So yeah, I do. I think we all we all want to be made to feel like we matter and that we that we have some importance. And so um, yeah, I think probably a pretty good way to nourish that is to be followed around by a camera crew night. And I day. mean, that's like the ultimate way to yeah. like make someone feel like they matter. Like, you're right. you're so interesting. I'm going to make a TV show about you, and millions of people are going to watch you. Like, yeah, okay. yeah, 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 yeah. I feel great. Right. Or right, you're so interesting that we're going to bring you into the red room for. <laughs> <laughs> Some people listening will know what that means. Uh, all right, so so you're at Letterman. How long did you work at Letterman uh, doing Stupid Human and Pet Tricks? All told, three years. Three years? Mm-hmm. And what happened after that? Why did you end up leaving? Well, so 
I got an opportunity to go back to the Ricky Lake show and produce. And so okay. that was like pretty, you know, pretty crazy. And so th- it's funny to think about this now because I'm like 23 and like, you know, making like power moves in my mind. Right. <laughs> um, and you know, I wasn't going to be producing at Letterman at 23. It just wasn't going to happen. But they, they were doing a new show called The Late Late Show with Craig Kilborn. And so they were like, you know, if you could go produce on that show and still do the pet tricks from there, from LA. And uh, so that moved me out to Los Angeles. So then I got to be a segment producer on The Late Late Show with Craig Kilborn and uh, still do the pet tricks from there. So that was like kind of amazing too. And, and um, you know, definitely like, you know, a big, um, a big lesson. And, you know, it got me, got me out here. Yeah. Um, which, you know, I don't know. Honestly, I don't know, like, would I have just kind of packed everything into a car, driven cross country, not knowing anyone, no leads, no contacts, no job, you know, I don't know. Um, from there, it was um, Animal Planet, and they were doing it, this is like right when American Idol came out, uh-huh. it's like, we're going to do American Idol of Pets. So oh, you're the guy for that job. <laughs> yeah, and it's funny too, I wish I kind of understood markets a little bit better then right because they need a former stupid pet trick coordinator right and there was like one woman who had it for like um like 14 years before i did and i think then retired and the person before that chris elliott right (laughs) and so um you can like the the actor chris elliott yeah he used to be a writer for letterman but for for a little bit for a little bit yeah that's funny yeah so it's down to me and elliott at this point (laughs) and um so, yeah, I mean, the, so that job, I used to get raises at the urinal, like the, because the, it, so we went from booking about, um, 12 acts a year and now all of a sudden we're doing 20 a weekend cause we would shoot, um, two shows. You need a tennis show. Right. So it was like 120 per season. So it was unbelievable. The, um, number that I, you know, had to hit. And, you know, if I was just got sick or was like, yeah, I don't think I'm going to be doing this anymore. Uh, Like none of the pigs and lizards can't make the show. Right. (laughs) So they were really like great to me. Um, you know, I had not negotiated the shrewdest deal, but literally like I would just like run into like the president of the company in the, um, hallway, give me a raise. Like we'd be like literally one time, um, peeing at the Uh urinals and it reached over, gave me a pat on the shoulder, gave me a raise. It wasn't as creepy as it sounded. It's a little odd. It wasn't that. It wasn't. I, I like. I think it's debatable if talking at the urinal is is okay, um, but patting on the shoulder. I feel like I draw the line at that. Patting, like, patting it, while money while money is being transacted. Yeah, I guess if there's money involved, maybe I'd be okay with it. But yeah, that's fine. So you have a price. <laughs> we all have a price bill. <laughs> um, so. Okay, so what what's, what was the show on Animal Planet? Is like a pet star, pet star. Yeah, Mario Lopez was the host. Wow! So now you're in the big time. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, the the one thing I think that when I think back on it, I, n- none of this stuff ever seemed ridiculous at the time. You know, it seemed like the biggest deal in the world. Yeah. Um, and yeah, you know, and that was, that was the first time I was managing people, and I had a department, and you know, very very real deadlines um i do i do think you say something that's important uh is when whatever job you're doing it should feel like the most important job in the world right like like if you were making that show and you're like oh all i'm doing is making a dumb show about pets with a former like a former actor saved by the bell lame like you wouldn't have succeeded you wouldn't have gone on to bigger and better things like you obviously have. Like I remember my first producing my, my, well, my first like field producing, uh, assignment was on a show called cupcake wars. And if you haven't seen cupcake wars, four contestants start three rounds of competition. They end in a finale round. Two people have to make a a thousand cupcakes and put them on a display, like a display that they, create out of their mind with the help of these two uh construction workers right and the you know the dirty secret of that show sorry food network is that those those displays are made in advance and like brought to los angeles and the construction workers are actually they are very talented construction workers but they don't actually build the display right so then so we had to shoot this beat this construction beat 
that made it look like these two construction workers built these displays over the course of like three hours. So that was my that was my segment. So there's like Jeremiah, associate producer on Cupcake Wars. You need to shoot the you're shooting the, the display construction beat. So I had to like look at the displays and like break it down into like what the elements were and then make a shopping list from that the Home Depot would go to or the PA would go to Home Depot and be like, I need this many sheets of plywood, this color paint. These were like rain gutters that they use to wrap around whatever. And then I had to shoot enough B-roll essentially of the construction workers constructing things that when they wheel the finished things out on stage, they look, it's like you, the audience would believe that these guys built these things. Right. And I mean, it sounds so, so dumb now, (laughs) but at the time I was like, I couldn't, I, I, I was, I lived for this fucking construction beat. Like I would think about it when I went home, like how can I make it just like this much better? And like, you know, I work with these two construction guys. Like, could you possibly like, do you have a tool that cuts in a perfect circle? And like, and like, I like took it so seriously, which is silly, but you know, I think that's, I think at some point somebody saw that or like noticed it and was like, okay, yeah, now let him produce the bigger thing. Right. So you produced the pet star show with Mario Lopez, someone noticed somehow, and now you produce bigger things. My, that's my point. No, I, I think that that is, you know, someone said, you know, in, you know, in order, um, you know, to get a great job, do a great job. Yeah. Right. And it, whatever you are. And no one ever said, you know, like, look at that kid dragging his feet uh, while he's getting sandwiches. He must... Um, be so smart and talented that he's way too good to be getting the lunch for the likes of a bunch of lowly producers like us. That kid is going somewhere. Right. Uh, get me his name. Bring him here right now. Let's let's send this kid up the ranks. <laughs> right. He's you clearly know? not made for this measly job. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I feel like, you know, I, and I really can remember um, seeing, you know, people that uh, we are working with right now who mm-hmm. are in huge roles in massive positions and noticing the first thing of like, Oh, that person is just going the extra mile right yeah. now, you know, and the way you do something is the way you do everything. Yep, exactly. Um, so how did you end up on the Hills? Cause I know that was a big, like a big point of your career, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I didn't know it at the time, but and when, um, so we did three seasons of pet star and what I, I always wanted to be a very serious writer. And that, that was always like my background just grew like up novels with. or screenplays. When I was at Cornell, I, I was really thinking that maybe that would be the funny thing is that seemed more accessible than working in Los Angeles and Hollywood mm. would be just, yeah, I'll just write best selling novels. I'll just be, you know, a, <laughs> a serious. Um, but, but, uh, so at that point I, you know, was writing, um, had some traction and had, representation and had a script with a big director and like it seemed like here we go um and so at the time and this will kind of resonate with you but they it was really early in reality tv in terms of these sort of we want to call them docu soaps or docu dramas right yeah um so they really didn't call them story editors and story producers in the story department called them writers yeah so i got a call uh, from a friend of mine who had worked at the Late Late Show, she, he had left um, to go work on the mole, right? And I was like, "You're an idiot. Um, that's a reality show, and that's obviously a fad going nowhere. You'll be back." <laughs> um, so now this is like maybe you know three <laughs> years later. Um, he's a staff executive producer at MTV, right? So I get called on. He's now my boss's boss, right? Um, Ruby Golam, he's an amazing guy, and. Uh, he was like, we're doing a spinoff of um, this show, Laguna Beach. I had no idea what it was. They needed someone for two weeks. And um, I was like, oh, maybe I could do that. I don't know about a reality show. He's like, at most, like two and a half. I was like, that's like pushing it. Maybe the two I could do, but I don't know about <laughs> that additional three days away from my very serious writing career. So um, so we come on and, you know, the so the other thing about that, right, at the time, reality shows had these huge concepts. These They were so high concept, right? So it'd be, you know, it's 14 couples. They're on an island. They're all going to cheat on each other and eat bugs for a million dollars. You know, just these like right, crazy right. concepts, right? And I was like, so what's this one about? They're like, it's about four girls. And I'm like, 
Okay, <laughs> tell me more. I'm listening. They're like, no, just that, just four girls. And so we're showing, and yeah, all these things were, you know, so my first day on the hills, you know, I met Lauren Conrad and Heidi Montag. And, um, you know, they seemed nice enough. They, um, they, the thing, all right, so here's, here's what I remember from that. So we, you know, we're just following them along, following along what they're doing. And I'm still in my mind kind of just thinking like, how is this going to cut together to be like must-see TV? Mm -hmm. And that was not clear to me at all. So they go down to, they were going to fit them at the time, the Fashion Institute of Design and Merchandise. Um, And uh, they went and met with their college counselor. So Lauren goes in and, you know, there's a saying that, you know, when reality meets expectation, you can just cut that out, right? Because we all know how that's going to go. So like, you know, meet with your college counselor, you want to impress them, show them how smart and hardworking you are. And that's exactly what Lauren does. And we're all just sort of listening along going, oh my God. Um, Heidi goes in and tells this person, I have not looked at the curriculum. I haven't given a thought to this. I want to be the fun LA party girl. And the woman is just like looking at her like, what and what are you talking about? And she's like, yeah, um, is there like a job where you just like party? And they're like, I mean, there's event planning, but that takes years to get into. She's like, oh, it's not like right away. Um, she's talking about her like other classes that she had taken before and that she never studied and like never bothered to show up. Um, and, you know, I was always like kind of a like trying to show the teachers that I, you know, deserve the best grade or yeah. trying to please my coach or whatever it was. Like, I know I was losing my mind. I just like couldn't even imagine. But then the whole thing started to kind of become clear, you know, and it's like, all right, so it's, you know, two women come to Los Angeles. One of them's going to do everything right. One of them's going to do everything wrong. They're going to do everything differently. And it just kind of like started to come alive for me. And then when we got in the edit bay, I, I, just it was heaven. Just we had this footage. We had a small amount of time to tell a story. Um, you know, we had the limitations felt like challenges. The um, the moments and really trying to heighten them and have a real clear point of view. You know, again, like I could have just done it all day. And I remember just you know just an editor in a dark room and just you know just trying to hone it and just try and take out every frame that's not moving the story forward. Every, take out, you know, there's an expression um, that composers have, eliminate neutral material. So just anything that's not exciting or different or unexpected until, you know, every frame is as good as it can be. If you took out one word, the whole thing would stop making sense and that everything was just as, as sharp and as focused as you could, as you could possibly make it. And so that show got picked up. Um, <laughs> Wait, was that for the, was that the pilot? Yeah, we shot a pilot. Yeah. Okay. And that's the premiere. Gotcha. And in, then they invited me back and, um, you know, so then I did the, you know, did the first episode, did the second episode. Um, you know, we ended up doing over a hundred episodes. Um, you know, what was, I think we did, I think we did eight, um, episodes the first season became phenomenon you know i think we did 27 episodes by like season three um and the the whole time that i was there um the whole first three years i'm still working on scripts and i'm writing and i'm taking these meetings and just kind of feeling like this is an interesting side gig and i enjoy it and i like it um but I'm a writer and that's what I'm, what I'm going to do. Were you still, was your title still writer on? No, the the, it was, um, God, I'm trying to, I, I think my, I think my first title was producer. Okay. And then, um, and then it was like senior producer and then supervising producer and then, uh, work myself up to, to co-executive producer. Um, but that, you know, is what, you know, I think often in these stories, there is that moment that someone, gets lucky and maybe they don't know it and you know now if you wanted to be a story producer you might be you might start off as a logger right in the field just Mm -hmm. typing down everything that happens then you might be story assistant if you do a good job at that 
Maybe you start to learn the Avid. You could become a story editor. And then finally, you'd be a story producer. And if you were really, really good, you might get so lucky that they might consider you for a big spinoff of a big show like Laguna Beach, and you might get to story produce The Hills. It's not most people's first job that they reluctantly agree to do. It's just so long <laughs> as you don't waste my time for more than two weeks. <laughs> right, right, right. So, it, you know, I, I feel very fortunate in, in terms of that. And then I also very fortunate that uh, the creator and showrunner, Adam DeVello, is just this brilliant guy who um, had such a clear vision and he didn't, would not stop until it was perfect and it was exactly the way that that he wanted and i thought that was probably a pretty great way to to come into it Mm -hmm. um rather than you know some jaded producer who's trying to churn out hours right i mean he was like he you know if if it was not exactly right it was like okay um call whoever you need to call cancel whatever plans you need to cancel let's order some dinner we're going to be here for a while Mm mm-hmm so how far into it, you say three years, did, were you, like, what, what was the moment for you where you, you sort of changed your mentality and you were like, okay, this is what I do for a living. This is who I am. I am a reality television producer, not a writer with, like, a side gig. Yeah, so the, um, the, the, the <laughs> it, it took a couple of pretty, like, big, you know, smacks over the head to kind of open my eyes to it. Um, like when it was on the cover of Rolling Stone, I was like, all right. So I think people are probably paying attention at this mm-hmm. point. Um, that was big in those days. I mean, I have to say like the, like the premiere parties and stuff like the, when a new season would come on, I mean, we're talking like blimps. We're talking like bus loads of like yeah. fan club, like, you know, maniacs coming in at you know, gigantic mansions. I mean, it was like expansive. The, the, we, we never really knew in too far in advance how um how long the season was going to last how many episodes they would want to do and so it was oftentimes like you know it was it felt very much like give us as much as you can as fast as you can right and so that was so fun and we're making all these episodes we would get a call and just sort of say actually so we're gonna um wrap and then we're back in 10 days so like go take a vacation whatever you need to do and it was often like very last minute so i went um on a surf trip to Australia. So I'm in Australia, um, woke up one day in one time zone in Byron Bay, woke up the next day in Sydney in a different time zone, woke up the next day back home in Los Angeles. And when I wake up, there's a voicemail from Adam DeVello's assistant saying that there's a position open in New York City to um, work on the spinoff of The Hills called The City, and Adam wants you to go. So I'm like, oh, God. So I run into the office and they're like, no, why are you here? And I was like, to talk about it, they're like nothing to talk about. Just go pack a bag and go to the airport. You're going <laughs> to New York. So now the fourth day I wake up in a fourth city um, in New York. And I do not know if it is day or night, if what hemisphere I'm in. And didn't really know exactly what um, I was kind of being called in there to do. It happened that quickly. It wasn't like months of like trying to get a spinoff and like- the, the spinoff was going so that someone was being replaced oh yeah. gotcha gotcha yeah. gotcha um and that you know he's a decisive person right gotcha. so just like yeah so we uh and this was after how many years on, uh, but on this is probably like four years or something like that okay so um you know we're going to the uh first production meeting you know have a seat there's only one seat left and it's at that head i was like well i don't want to be presumptuous but I'll take this chair and it's supposed to start you know at 11 a.m. and it's not starting and uh waiting for like this is kind of disorganized here you know like what we're, what's the leadership like here that we're just you know sitting around here chatting and it took me a second to understand that i'm in charge now and this is my meeting and so literally just like out of like a bad sitcom at like you know 11:09 a.m. we just finally realized like well okay so let's get down to it here's what we're gonna do <laughs> wait they they didn't tell you this in advance this it was, was just a very different thing it was just a very different thing so yeah i was like i was running the field so you know adam yeah. of course still the, the showrunner but uh you know that i was you know heading it up there with my friend spike too um was out there but uh it that's a funny thing that happens with i think with a lot of um people who come up through 
um, the creative side coming up through as a writer, you know, friends who are, you know, big feature directors now came up as writers, um, or, you know, in our field, you know, come up as a story producer and then, you know, get into, um, leadership roles and show running is that it's like, all right, that person is really good at sitting in a dark room by themselves and typing in a laptop. So probably should put them in charge of 80 people (laughs) tomorrow. (laughs) And, you know, and that's what it is. And, you know, the, and all of a sudden, you know, and, and 80 interesting people, right? Because, you know, you've got your crew and then you've got your cast and the people we pick for these shows are extroverts who, yeah. you know, think out loud and, and act out. And, you know, that is something you have to be ready for at any moment, right? That your, your phone can ring and it's going to be someone who might have strong opinions about something sure, and, and really want to talk about it. Um, but that, you know, that was an amazing experience and, you know, I really, I really loved it. But the, you know, the thing, if there's something that gives me stress, if there's something that I worry about the most is that you look around and, uh, you know, if there are 80 people, you know, they're, they're counting on you to do your best. And it, um, you know, if you do well, then hopefully everybody can do well by it. If you, you do a bad job, um, you know, everyone could really feel that too. Mm -hmm. And so that just got to a point where, you know, I felt as I do today, just really lucky to have this special opportunity and, you know, the, the crews count on you. The cast is putting a ton of trust in you, right? Cause they're opening up their lives and inviting you in. And, um, you know, if you were to look back on it and go, God, that I wasn't as great as it could have been, or, you know, maybe that could have, could have been a little stronger um, if it had my undivided attention, you know, I wouldn't be able to, wouldn't be able to live with that. So that was when I was just sort of like, all right, th- this is like, you know, I got a rare opportunity here to hopefully make this something that, that we can all look back on and, and feel really proud of. And, and so that was really the moment when I was like, you know, I'm not missing it. This is it. Right. So you kind of let the, the writing dream die. Yeah, I don't usually put it like that. I don't usually put it, <laughs> and that was the day I let my dream die. Wait, so when you were on the hills, you were you were mostly a post guy, right? right? And right. I, I know you'd go out to set here and there, but you weren't like the front line of dealing with the cast. And then you then you were chosen uh, to to go run the field on the city, and now all of a sudden you are the guy that's on the front line to deal with a cast. What was that like for you? Just like, cause like dealing with reality talent is, I mean, it's a, it's, it's hard. It's a skill. It's uh it's like something that I don't, I don't know if can be taught. I think it's like, I, I, I mean, I don't, I've been doing it for like almost 10 years now and I still don't quite understand it. So like, what was that like for you go, go, going from like the edit bay to all of a sudden dealing with these people that are, you know, the, the big thing personalities. that here's what helped me through was I, I really do believe in being very clear and honest about exactly the project that you're making, right? So that's like with, you know, sharing all the information you have with the crew um, and being really upfront with the cast. And here's what we're going for, right? No surprises. Like, we're, here's the story we're telling. And so I feel like if you're upfront and honest, then you, there's nothing that can kind of, catch you off guard in other words you're it, at least in that regard you're in the right so you literally had to write myself a little note that you know if my phone rings and it's someone furious about something um it might be a misunderstanding but it no one caught me doing anything wrong right because i've been honest and upfront. and you have to then you really have to hold yourself to it right so that you can kind of have that confidence right um but like remind myself like don't start with a, you know, oh my God, I'm so sorry, or an apologetic tone, right? That you might be upset about something and I do want to hear it, um, but we're making a TV show. None of this is a surprise. And so let's talk about, you know, how we can move forward. Um, but I am not going to come at it from any position of apologizing for just doing my best job to mm-hmm. make the show that we all work for. Yeah, that's interesting. I remember having some sort of like almost where like 
a moment where I almost felt like I saw, like I saw through the matrix in a way when like dealing with like cast where it's just like, it, it's kind of like you said, it's like you, you agreed to do this and now we're just trying to make it the best we can. And just like being like that upfront and honest about like, let's just like, how are we going to make the best show here? Um, I think early on in my career, I was scared to mention the show. I don't know if that, that makes sense in a way. Like I was like, I, I was like, I was like nervous to sort of acknowledge in a way what we were doing. Does that make sense? Like, I, like I, like I almost like I felt like I had to approach it more from like a personal level, and this is their life, so let's talk about that. But like when when I was able to kind of like be comfortable enough to be like, okay, we're no, we're making TV here. You signed up for this, and let's work together to make it the best that we both can. I don't know. I feel like that was that was some sort of mental block for me. That's so interesting, but. I mean, I think that is where maybe it helps to, you know, really love and admire, you know, the product. Right. And just from a little like from I remember like as a little kid um, that when there would be like a special on. Right. That like it felt like a like a big, important night. Right. And Mm -hmm. you kind of know now. Right. Oftentimes specials are the network's trying to save money. So they're going to like, put together a <laughs> clip package. They don't have to shoot anything for, right. They're going to regurgitate and recycle, you know, some things you've seen a million times and like call it a special. But like I, for me, like I really believe that like it was special mm-hmm. and, but I, I feel that way now of just like, you know, when, when people are just sort of like, Oh, like what time are we going to be here? To, like, we're making a TV show. What in the world do you have to do right now right. What's more that would be more than important than this? Like, we're, like we're, millions of people are going to watch this. Are you going to dinner with ten million people right now that you have to get <laughs> out of here? You're going to rush through this. Um, that I, I just think all the time of like flipping channels. You know, ten, twenty, thirty years from now. You know, I never want to think. Oh God, I've been meaning to change that song or like, I just never really liked that interview, but I think we could have done better. You know, you want to go back and go, yeah, there it is that it's up there on the screen. The very best we could do. Yeah, totally. So how long did the city last? That was, oh God, I want to say like probably like 30, 40 episodes and the Hills and the city ended at the same time. So two, was it two seasons? Like, it, it it might've been, but it might've been like a season two A and two B right. or something like that. MTV does. Yeah. That. Uh, so that ended and the Hills ended and, and what happened? Where did you go from here? So then the way, so, at the, <laughs> so it, I was, uh, assured by MTV that the city would not end. <laughs> so went ahead and sold my car, got rid of my beautiful Venice Canals apartment, ditched all my furniture, I'm a New Yorker now, um, got a call, um, from a production company to executive produce Lauren Conrad's spinoff. And so I was like, that is so sweet, but I've got this job and I couldn't possibly do it. And uh, the production company, like just very diplomatically in trying to be gently said, you know, MTV um, seems to think that you will be available. And I was like, <laughs> oh God. Um, so, I mean, but a pretty nice, you know, parachute. So came out with my friend, um, Spike, um, who um, Spike Van Vriesen, who's an amazing producer, and, the, and so the two of us um, were the showrunners on um, Lauren Conrad's spinoff, which uh, unfortunately didn't quite work. Mm-hmm. I learned a little bit of a lesson there because the was that it, also was that also for MTV? It was for MTV. Okay. Yeah, and it was going to be a different type of show, and things were there. There had been some changes. The executives that had shepherded the hills and Laguna Beach and the city uh, were now gone. And so it was a bit of a regime change. And I think they were moving in, in a slightly different direction and probably more kind of in the Jersey Shore teen mm. mom direction. And this was going to be a lot gentler. Um, to Lauren's credit, you know, she's pretty amazing and, you know, just as smart and driven as she is. And she was really upfront of like, this is the kind of show that I'm interested in making. And um, it would be great to do it. And if it's not what you guys are into, no hard feelings, mm. but like it was not really a negotiation, but she like could not have been clearer. And then she absolutely came through on exactly, you know, what it was going to be. But I think, I honestly do think that they sort of hope that like, but maybe Spencer and Heidi will like run through and like, you know, ruin her birthday and make her cry. And <laughs> it was just never going to be that. Yeah. Um, 
but the, I do think, you know, if you, if you're saying you want to produce, you're saying, I think I have something to say. And I think that I have some sense of what is good and what is not good. I think I have a taste for what's entertaining. And so then if the very first project that's offered to you does not appeal to those sensibilities, then why in the world would you do it? Right. So I'm either kind of saying that, you know, I think that, you know, this isn't very good, but I'm going to do it anyway. Or maybe I think that maybe I'm not good because maybe I don't know what's good, but it, it, it didn't necessarily seem to me like this is going to be a thrilling show that's going to go for years and years and years. And, um, very, you know, smart people told me that it was, it was going to be great. Mm -hmm. And it was a big opportunity. Um, you know, so I took it and, you know, no, no hard feelings or anything like that, but it just kind of, it, what I think, what I learned from it, let, like, let me go down swinging. Let me, let me do what I think is going to be, um, really great and put everything behind it. Um, cause I don't think you can really do your best work if you're not starting from there. Right. It's a hard thing though. Like, especially you coming up because like as a freelancer, like you want to work and I've taken plenty of jobs where I'm like, Oh God, this sounds like a, this sounds awful, but I need to pay my mortgage. So like, I, I don't, I just, I've never found that I've been in the, the position of luxury to be able to just pass on projects, you know, until I found the thing that, you know, was that matched my sensibilities or that I believed in wholeheartedly. I think I've been very lucky to have fallen into projects that I have become very passionate about, but it's a hard thing to do, you know, to, for me at least to, to just like, you know, n not do things because you're like, ah, oh, well, something else will come along. And maybe I just, I haven't been brave enough and maybe I haven't been in a position where, uh, you know, I've had to, I, I've, I've, I've been lucky to like keep working. So maybe at some point I will be in that position where I can, you know, be more selective, but you know, that's, it's, it's a good lesson that you learned. Absolutely. Now, the thing that was good about it was that I did meet this whole new production company. Mm -hmm. And then when they had a show going for the history channel that needed a new producer, um, they put me up for that. And so now all of a sudden after, you know, I, I called it, you know, six years of chasing around drunk, crying teenage girls with mm -hmm. a camera now doing, you know, hard history and like <laughs> World War II investigations on the History Channel. That was decoded? Decoded, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and that too was again, you know, it is always just like, there's nothing more interesting than pulling the curtain back on anything. Mm -hmm. So um, that show, I'm thinking, you know, my first day I'll probably just meet, you know, the research team. Probably, I'm guessing, a bunch of Harvard grads and tweed sport coats, smoking pipes and like, library of leather bound books and uh we get there and it's um my buddy and me on wikipedia just <laughs> like looking stuff up and writing the scripts as fast as we can type yeah 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 and you know if we could double source it good put it on the history channel <laughs> and uh that so that the show was it was like kind of a little bit after national treasure but that's like sort of what they envisioned the show to be like that um you know they'd be looking it was a team of investigators and they're trying to either uh, confirm or debunk urban legends, but they're rooted in history. But the idea, I think, when it was pitched would be that they would like, you know, flip over a dollar bill and see that it was actually a treasure map and then go and find <laughs> it, you know. And that just, the thing you kind of learn really quickly about all these conspiracy theories is that they all just come down to, could someone make a buck off of it? And once right. you kind of figured out who likes the gain it all just like came out in like the most simple way. Very little of it is that, you know, all these celebrities were in, you know, some secret underground temple performing, you know, a Masonic ritual. I mean, it, it just, that just honestly, smart people don't think that. Yeah. And most of them you could, <laughs> you could figure out with like 15 minutes on Wikipedia. <laughs> and so then we would have to, <laughs> we would have to set it up that um, the 
cast of the show, the investigators, in order to come to this conclusion, would travel the world, right? <laughs> so it would be something... They didn't have access to Wikipedia. No, but so that was what was, like, really funny about it would be that it would, like, that, you know, it would be something about, like, uh, you know, some theory about the, the, the height and width of the Vatican was actually secret coordinates to, you know, some hidden, you know, um, treasure that was, like... Um, put there in a secret position by a former Pope or something like that. So they're like, all right, so we need to figure out, um, you know, that height and width of the Vatican. All right. So I went online and I looked up flights. We're going to Rome. (laughs) That's funny. Uh, Did that show go one, two seasons? Uh, Two seasons. Two seasons. So you did that. Uh, That's a big pivot. I feel like, I feel like a lot of production companies wouldn't have had the faith in someone that was sort of like specializing in docu soaps and chasing teenage girls around with cameras to like transition into historical, you know, just adventure investigative kind of things. Like, why do you think that that company trusted you with that? That is a good question. And when they, when the production company put me up for it, cause I had to get vetted by the network and I had to get, it was two production companies and, uh, they, they were sort of like, you won't get it, but you should meet them. And it's interesting. And I, I did, I have always, I do love books and stories and tricks and trivia. And so that part of it really appealed to me. And I was able to speak to that. Um, and you know, it was just kind of talked through, you know, how I would, how, how I would do it, how I would tell that story, you know, how, how I would lay it out so that it was, um, you know, a journey that the viewer could go on with them and make it feel active and dynamic. And, uh, so yeah, we, we talked through it, but yeah, it's a, it's an outlier, you know, for sure in my career. Um, so I, I think if I, if I had to say, I just, I think that I just, I thought about it a lot and I just made sure that I could, that I could put it into words that Mm -hmm. I could just make them see it the way that I was seeing it. Which is good. I, it is, it, it, I do think that people kind of want to pigeonhole, us or like anyone, you know, like it's just like, oh, Bill, he's the emotional docu soap guy, you know. But I mean, if you're if you have good sensibilities and you can tell a story and you're smart and you can approach things with curiosity, I mean, of course you can make a history show. But so that's good. So I think this brings us to the period of your career where we intersected, right? After decoded. You got you came on to Vanderpump Rules. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. So how did how did that happen? How did your name end up on the the desk or in the ears of Doug, uh, uh, Doug Ross and Alex Baskin? So at this point, I'm working with an agency, and as a freelance showrunner, you take a bunch of meetings. Mm-hmm. That there are shows that production companies have sold to various networks. So some of it might be to produce a pilot and some might be to produce a series. And so whatever reason, I was going on a ton of meetings. They just needed, there were a lot of shows had been sold that needed showrunners. So I was taking a ton of meetings. Nothing really grabbed me. I think maybe this is kind of why I mentioned the thing, you know, at MTV earlier was that I, I was like, I have to trust my gut on this. And yeah. If I don't feel like this is going to be, you know, a show... Um, you know, cause the truth of it is like, you know, I, I, my resume is for the most part, you know, still one page and I've been doing it for 22 years cause the shows have gone on and that's a, a real, a real luxury and something that I really, that I really like. So my agent said that there's a show, they didn't actually know too much about it, but, um, meeting with evolution and it's going to be one of the real housewives from one of the real housewives franchises. And I said, well, I hope it's Real Housewives of Beverly Hills and I hope it's Lisa Vanderpump. <laughs> and sure enough. And so I went in and met with Doug Ross and Alex Baskin. And I will say right away, I could tell that they were different. And it's such an obvious thing. But the biggest thing that they did was listened. Mm. A lot of times you go in these things and the people are just talking and yeah. talking and talking about how great they are and what they sold. And they're just selling past the close, mm-hmm. you know? Um, 
And the first thing that Doug and Alex said was, what would you do with this? How would you approach it? And then they, they showed me the reel. And I will never forget yeah. that casting reel. And, you know, just seeing all these unbelievable characters that are just popping off the screen. And they look like television stars. And Lisa Vanderpump is narrating it with the million dollar voice. And, you know, just as funny and clever and witty as she is. And then the idea of a restaurant as an organizing principle, that just so much about it appealed to me of, you know, the, here we have this woman who is so elegant and sophisticated. And here we have these bartenders and waitresses who are not so elegant and sophisticated <laughs> and they have to work together. And they all had such strong voices but they all were going to come back to this one place over and over and over again because that's where they worked and that's where they got their paychecks. And so it just kind of solved all these issues that I had when I watched reality TV of these people clearly despise each other. Why are they going on vacation to Costa Rica? You know, that person just sent her husband to prison for tax fraud. Why is she inviting her to her 1920s great Gatsby party. Like it doesn't make any sense. <laughs> right. But, you know, with, with this, and it, I will say more than, than anything, like, it was just like, I know exactly what I would do with this. I know exactly how I would approach this. I know exactly what I would say to the cast. I know what it should sound like and what it would look like. I mean, and a lot of that was, you know, already, you know, because the reel was one of the best reels, um, you know, that I've seen ever. Um, do you remember what your pitch was like what your sort of like take on it and how you sort of what you what you told them you'd do well one thing i remember is that i i immediately told my agent that i don't want to take any other meetings and i'm still not going to accept accept any other jobs until i know beyond a shadow of a doubt that i do not have this one because i i really believed in it that much um and it took a while and i had to meet um with doug and alex a, a few times um the uh I'm trying to think about the, oh we you know the the thing that um that i mean a lot of this we did end up doing you know the like for example i remember i was really um i really liked the idea that sheena was just starting to work there because i love a fish out of water because now we have an excuse for people who know the world so well to tell sheena about it but they're really telling the audience about it mm-hmm. so we could you know kind of see it you know through through Sheena's eyes. And I mean, it was something I remembered and I probably use this as an example, but for, um, for, you know, the Hills was quite literally the beginning of it is Lauren Conrad drives from Laguna beach to the Hills and she's our guide. And I think a lot about guides on, um, shows. And I remember this thing from hearing from a sitcom writer that, um, the person whose place it is, you, you kind of trust them. So if it's Cheers, you trust Sam Malone. Or if it's Will and Grace, it's Will's apartment, you're going to trust Will. So that, like for Will and Grace, you know, the character Jack is not that likable in some ways, right? Because he's just like, you know, he's selfish and he's, you know, can be dishonest. But Will likes him and Will is hosting us at his place. So we will trust him. So I, I'm always like thinking about that. Like who's the, who's the host, you know? So Lisa's like a great host. Yeah. Um, we did a thing on the Hills that I really remember when the, at first Lauren's in every scene, but of course she's not going to be. And so we really did this thing where um, she says goodbye to Heidi for a second. And she's like, all right, so Heidi, so you're going to go to class now and I'm going to be over here and we're going to be separated. But afterwards you'll come back and then we will be together again. And, but she's really just telling the audience, like, you know, the cameras are going to go with Heidi for a second and <laughs> yeah, it's going to yeah. be OK. And then we're going to come back and it's it's going to be cool. Um, but so in the first episode, Lisa sort of does that with Sheena a little bit. Right. And then we're like literally like Sheena's like walking from Real Housewives of Beverly Hills, like walking away from what ended up being Lisa Vanderbump and, and Brandy Glanville yeah. um, into Sir, you know, and it's like, all right, Lisa's blessed Sheena. We can be with Sheena now. If Sheena's going to go into Sir and Vanderpump Rules, we're in Vanderpump Rules now, you know, and now we're going to meet these people. And then that, all right, now we've kind of hit the max and we go back to Lisa now. Okay, good. We're, we're home. We're safe. You know, right. now we're going to go out. Now we're going to go to Stassi's apartment, you know, but now we're back to Lisa. So I don't know. I remember, I remember 
thinking a lot about that of how we're like how we're going to tell the audience that like we're going someplace new it's going to be different it's going to look different it's going to sound and feel different but it's going to be okay <laughs> uh so you say it took a while like a lot of me did you have to meet with bravo as well yeah yeah who I, did you meet with at bravo? ryan flynn you met with ryan flynn that's, yeah that's so yeah. funny had you ever worked with him before no no oh that's amazing how'd that meeting go yeah, I mean, it, it you know it went well. I mean, so you know, Ryan Flynn is our executive on Vanderpump Rules. Um, he is, I hope I get this right, senior vice president um, uh, production at at Bravo. So um, he's a network exec who's done tons of Bravo shows. Extremely smart guy, very passionate. Um, you know, he wants to make it perfect. He wants every episode to be you know just as as sharp and as um, as as packed as they can possibly be and you know he um was not you know an easy interview right mm-hmm. you know because he too thought this can be great so like you tell me how are you going to make it great um and you know it's been seven years i was on the phone with him today talking about yeah. you know the finale how are we going to make it great yeah um so it, it that all has been the, the the best you can hope for um you know, given that an executive's job is literally to criticize your work, right? <laughs> so if you kind of think of it like that, of, you know, the one thing you can count on every single morning is you're going to go <laughs> and there'll be someone, you know, to, to look and kind of, you know, is that someone who's going to make it better and drive you to do your very best work, you know, inspire, um, you know, add great ideas and, and hopefully elevate the material. And, you know, we're lucky in this case that it is. Uh, what do you think that, that, uh, Doug and Alex and Ryan saw in you? Why do you think they chose you to run this show? That's a hard question to answer, but I, the, the one thing that I'm always trying to do, right. And cause if you think about it, we're, we're, we're going into battle, you know, with 60, 70, 80 people, some of whom we're never going to meet each other that I do always try to put it into words, right? Into one sentence, what we're, what we're doing. So that, you know, the guy who's writing the music, who may never meet the editor, um, you know, the camera operator who may never meet the story producer, that we're all making the same show. And so I give a lot of thought. I do my homework. I try to be prepared. And so without knowing exactly, the one thing I can say is that I, I never went in unarmed. So I was always able to say, you know, you might have a different idea. Someone might have a better idea, but here's my idea. And I'm going to tell it to you as clearly as I can. Yeah. I will say working for you now for seven years, you are one of the most thoughtful, uh, intelligent showrunners that I've ever worked for. So I, I know what they saw in you. Yeah. Um, so here's something, uh, it's fun. So as you're, as you're putting that staff together, for season one of Vanderpump Rules. This is a brand new show. It's a spinoff of Housewives, so it's great because it's got a kind of like launching pad and a, and a built-in audience, but it, it's, it's a new show, totally new crew. Um, what, did, what was your thinking as far as like how you're going to put this staff together? Like was there, any, was there ever any uh, suggestion or pressure from evolution it's like they, they they wanted the housewives guys to all roll over and do it or was it always like welcome to the show bill find the people that you're going to work with yeah that's one thing about evolution is they were very much you know they i i feel like they're almost like i think of it like a, almost like a like a record label that mm. they go out and try to find people and that might not be exactly how I would do it or my taste might be a little bit different, but like how else could you be except for all of you? So, you know, that whenever there's a problem, you know, if I ever get in trouble and I'm talking to Doug about it, the president and founder of the company, the first thing he always says, what would you, what would you do? What do you think you should do? Um, it's, it, which is really like the best thing you can ask for. And, you know, really like, it, you know, it's a, it that builds a little, gives you a little confidence, you know, it's very empowering, you know, and then when you get in trouble and you're on your own, you know, you go, all right, well, like, let's do what I, you know, do what I do. Um, so I, I did want the uh, crew to be younger and, you know, 
a little bit, um, you know, maybe a little hungrier and a little, a little edgier. Um, one thing that, you know, kind of goes back to what you were asking, but in, in my pitch, I wasn't too shy about saying, you know, I've been watching tons of Bravo and housewives, and this is what I think works so well and is so great. And here's what I don't like. And, but I think we can do differently. And Bravo was really great about that. Because there are a couple things, and they don't seem like such big things, but even just not to have the banners across like you do on a housewife show, right. you know, where they turn around in slow motion with their hand on their hips, like that was not. Stasi Schroeder wasn't doing a lot of that when she was twenty three, you know, turning <laughs> around with her sassy hands on her hips. Um, that we were going to have lyrics in the music, and that I knew a way to do it. You know, that we didn't have the MTV money, but I thought we could find a way to license tracks and make it affordable and still, you know, stay under budget and that we'd be handheld a little bit more and that um, we wouldn't be afraid to be behind people and that it might be a little more raw and it's going to be, you know, a little bit, a little bit more, um, we're going to, there aren't going to be doors on this show. You know, we'll be, we'll be on the inside as well, you know? Um, And so, that was a big thing when we were hiring people, you know, just let people know that like, it, you know, it's going to get real and we're going to be ambitious with our storytelling and we're going to be with the cast for everything. Um, and so that, that was like a really um, big thing there. Yeah. We, you know, cause we didn't take a lot of Beverly Hills and Orange I don't think County any, people, anybody. Yeah. It was like a brand, it was all brand new crew. When we started, we had two crews and you know, for anyone that I'm, um, that, doesn't know which might be anyone that's listening like i'd like a lot of the house a lot of the crew members camera audio producers that work on house size of beverly hills also work on house size of orange county they have a very a great setup where they go back and forth between those two shows but i i mean i i could imagine it that this was a housewife spinoff that they would have been like you know what you know these camera operators have been working on housewives for x amount of years why don't you take them but like the the crew that you hired was all we were all outsiders and sort of like ruffians in a way. <laughs> we always talked about it, you know, like that first year, especially like we felt so different than everyone else at evolution. Like we felt like the sort of like, you know, redheaded stepchild of the building. And like, we all dressed differently and looked and it just like, we just felt different. We shot on different cameras and our cast was way younger um, so that's interesting. It's just, it's, I, I'm curious to hear, you know, like what you, like what other thoughts you had as you were like putting together this, this team. So I'll tell you two things about hiring that, um, I learned the hard way, but the, the first is I try to interview every single person for yeah. a couple of different reasons. But, uh, one of them is it's my opportunity to, uh, put the show into words for them of exactly what we're doing. Right. And, you know, for a lot of these really talented people, they might work on, you know, 10, 15 shows and, you know, I don't want them to go, all right, we were shooting cupcakes yesterday and it's going to be motorcycles. What are we doing today? The restaurant thing. Okay. The restaurant thing, you know, I, I really want this story to explode in their mind. You know, we are, we are telling a story and we're following these people and the characters are rich and vivid. Um, and so, you know, it's my, I think it's my chance to set the tone and say like, we got a special experience here. We're working for a great production company and the network's behind us. And you know, it's going to be, we got a plus talent. And then the second thing is, cause I've always like, what am I looking for? Right. You know, I'm sitting in the room waiting for the person to walk in. What am I hoping for? But I think the thing you're really looking for is someone who can't help themselves. So what I mean by that is just someone who everyone's going to come in and go, I'm going to work so hard and I'm so motivated, but there's usually something, you know, if you talk, get them talking, that they'll say, and it often reveals itself in the form of embarrassment when they're just talking about something that they uh, feel is a little weird or a little different, but they're just so passionate about their work that they can't help themselves. Um, so, for example, um, I was interviewing for field producers, mm-hmm. and uh, this guy could not come in. Um, so we had to do it by Skype. You're talking and, about me. But. <laughs> and uh, so um, we get on, and I hate Skypes. Um, I do not love 
hearing my own voice as we're doing right now, you know, that <laughs> you turn on your computer, right? And you're shot from below, right? Fluorescent <laughs> lights. No, it's not flattering. You're like, oh God, is that what I look like today? You know, everyone's trying to lean out of the frame. You know, you're kind of like hoping like, all right, does this count as like, you know, being part of it? it just feels so goofy and impersonal. Um, and then there comes you just... <laughs> Front on center, eyes locked, fill in the frame, just, you know, huge smile, big eyes, bigger glasses, you know, magnificent mane or flaming red hair. And I'm just like, who is this maniac that is enjoying a Skype interview right now? Just like so happy to be meeting new people. You're so enthusiastic about this imaginary show that does not exist yet. And you're, you know, just so into it. And you had come really highly recommended from people you'd worked with um, at Extreme Makeover. And I was just sort of like, is he always like this? And they're like, yeah, Jeremiah's always like this. Um, and then, as you remember, you politely declined. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, so I'll give, you, I'll give you my end of it. I was rapping, uh, I was in like the last week of this show uh, that was for Nat Geo called Border Wars, where I was like down in McAllen, Texas, chasing these Border Patrol agents around. And I was just like trying to find my next thing, like whatever that thing was. And so I was like sending emails and applying to things on Staff Me Up, this website that has job listings and stuff. And yeah, it just, it was like, oh, this Bravo show, Housewife spinoff. And I was like, oh, okay. I don't, I don't really watch Bravo. I don't. Uh, no, any, I've never watched the housewives. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I always like to take a meeting. So sure. So yeah, so I had this Skype interview and, uh, and then it's, however it went down, but like got the offer from the line producer or whatever. And I was like really conflicted about it. And I think I've told you this before. Um, cause for two reasons, one was I was about to have my first child and I had, uh, you know, all these like Lamaze classes I had to go to and I knew I was going to want a little time off for the baby to be born and you know typically production is not the most uh, accommodating industry and especially a first season show to have one of the producers be like oh, I've got to take a week or two off in the middle of production I just was like that's going to be that's going to be a non-starter but then two and I think I've told you this before but at the time I was like doing like Food Network and Extreme Makeover Home Edition and Nat Geo and I was like oh I don't do trashy reality. I'm like, I'm the highbrow reality guy. I don't need to stoop to the level of doing this like gossipy, you know, just like lowbrow shows. <laughs> so that, that was a big reason of why I was like, ah, this just doesn't. It was the two things combined, the kid and the, and the just feeling above it uh, that made me decline. So I sent you that email, which I, I posted uh, at some point, I think I posted on uh, Instagram, but I'll, I'll find a way to put it back up, or, you know, in the notes of the show or a link to it or something. You can I have the email, the actual email. So I sent you that email. And then what happened? Why do you remember? Yeah. Yeah. I, I politely declined your polite <laughs> declination. <laughs> um, so I remember it so differently. So I, I think if we were to look at the books, the, what you ended up missing was maybe two and a half days. Yeah, it ended up not being a lot. Right, but this is how it's presented to me. Jeremiah is really uh, conflicted. He does not think he can do, he can't commit to you because he has other commitments. He feels like he won't be able to do his best job because he might have to miss a few days. Okay, what does he have to miss him for? And I thought it was going to be his buddy's bachelor party or like he takes a trip to, you know, Wrigleyville or something. The birth of his first child. (laughs) And I'm like, this guy... (laughs) is a family commitment and he's like apologizing that he might have to miss like a couple of days and (laughs) couldn't be fully committed to us. And like, that's a pretty valid excuse. And, you know, it just was this feeling of like that. I mean, I feel like that's your thing is like commitment. Right. And you can't help yourself that in the second season, you called me one time at the office and you're like, all right, so Bell, we're got this scene. We're shooting. It's good, but I think it could be great. But we might just have to go like a little bit over. I just know there's something there. And if we pursue it, I just think that I think there's there's something that's that's gonna be worthwhile. And you were so you're apologizing for it. You're just like so sorry that you're trying to do a great job. You're just like so apologetic 
that you might have to go into 15 minutes of overtime to get an epic scene. And it's like the same thing. You're talking about these like cupcakes, right? I mean, you're like, it's not, you didn't wake up and decide like, I'm able to do a pretty good job. And like, you can't help yourself. Like you have to make it the best cupcake reveal ever. No one's going to ever see cupcakes as good as this, you know? <laughs> and that it just was so obvious. It just came through, you know, that you were going to be, you know, as nice and as funny and as personable as you are. And, just that you were gonna you were gonna figure it out and figure out how to you know get the the very best out of this cast. Well, you're very sweet to say all these things, but at the time, like I had no business field producing on a Bravo show. Like I feel like if me seven years ago me would walk in the door now to apply to be a field producer on season eight of Vanderpump Rules, you and I would look at that resume and be like, oh, this guy's not qualified for this job like he did i'd never worked on bravo i had never worked on a docu soap i'd done a f- big formatted reality show extreme makeover as like a segment producer i was a field producer on this border war show which is i mean it's just it couldn't be more different i'd done cupcake wars uh a handful of other things but i wasn't like t- now i mean if, i just feel like like why like why 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 did you hire me <laughs> Uh, yeah, I I have to chalk a little bit up to a feeling because I, I did not shake I did not shake your hand before right you know yeah, offering you never a job met in three times but the look th- that's the hardest job you know for us to fill right because we need someone who uh, you know is great with cast so they're a talent producer and they also need to be great with location so they're a location producer right and they also need to keep a schedule moving so they're a production manager right and then also by the way you're also a director. And you have to be able to 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 do all that, and you should have a strong story sense too. So you should be like a senior story producer, and you know there are people who have that, and they are showrunners, right? So like for someone like that, and you the other thing too, you uh, like negotiated down your own rate in the interview <laughs> too. So I'm like, he's not in it for the money. I don't remember that. Yeah, it was shrewd, my friend. Um, so that you know, and so the big thing was like, all right, like can he? can he talk to people? You know, is this someone that's, that's personable? Um, but you know, quite honestly, you know, the, if you can enjoy a Skype interview, like then you are, you know, a weird kind of freak, right? That if you were making connections over, you know, a scratchy internet, um, you know, Wi-Fi annoying interview, um, then, you know, we just knew you'd be, you'd be great. And you know, the, the thing I say about you, people ask me about Jeremiah Smith. They say, <laughs> you know, as you understand, do a show for seven years. No one can be cool with all the crew and all the cast and the network and the production company, right? Everybody is going to rub a few people the wrong way and make a couple enemies along the, all along the way. Unless you're Jeremiah Smith. <laughs> uh, that's very nice. All right, we should probably transition away from just talking about how awesome I am. Um, but I do want to point out you, you made a good decision hiring me clearly. Cause here I am still seven years into it. <laughs> oh no, buddy. You, you, you made, I uh, honestly, it, it has been my, my honor and my pleasure. And at the, I just, I, I think the world of you. It's, it's very mutual. Thank you. Um, so why do you think Vanderpump rules is as successful as it is. Why do you think this show works? And you talked, you talked a bit about it as far as like the, the, the organizing principle of the restaurant and, you know, Lisa obviously is a great, a great talent. Um, and we have great cast, but what, is there anything else you could say about why you think this show has, has lasted and has, you know, resonated with as many people as it has for as long as it has, which is so rare right yeah like, to be on a show this long that's like still and every original cast member <clears throat> yeah every single every original cast member still except for tina mcdowell <laughs> sorry tina um and and like dander pump rules is doing this weird thing and i, I don't want to like jinx it or or you know seem like i'm bragging because i don't think this has anything to do with with me but like it it's our ratings haven't like grown year to year like if you look back they're they're fairly consistent through this through the seven seasons but i do feel like in the last year or so and we've talked about this at the office like it seems like just culturally 
it, it's it's broken through somehow where just more people are aware of it. It's it's spoofed more. It people post about it more. Are like uh, magazines write about it more. It just seems like it's 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 kind of like popped into a different level of like pop cultural awareness. So like what like what do you what do you think it is? The cast. I think the the cast is just a plus. So Lisa Vanderpump, like there, there is no substitute, right? And I just always think about imagine if we were making Vanderpump Rules the movie, right? So first now we got to just find you know a beautiful, sophisticated actress to play Lisa, right? Now, so that maybe there are two or three people in Hollywood, right, who who could pull that off and and have that grace and charm and that voice and that presence. So now she's going to pull up at, you know, a beautiful restaurant. So now we just need to like get a location scout and a set designer, you know, and an artistic director to make it look as beautiful as she makes her restaurants look. Now we need a car producer, right, to get a Rolls Royce. It's going to have pink rims on it, right, and a pink <laughs> interior. Um, we need a, probably a customer and a wardrobe, right, to dress her and who's going to source all the jewelry and the shoes, right? An animal wrangler for <laughs> yeah, <laughs> all the for dogs. For Pomeranians, <laughs> yep. Yeah, um, and, you know, now hair and makeup, right? Um, and to try and get someone, you know, to look that, that beautiful. And then we'll just need, like, a team of writers to be that funny and that witty. So we're talking, like, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars of production value, that we get by putting her name on the call sheet, right? Yeah. So just we we want to have that level of it. Um, just enter Lisa Vanderpump, and then, like that's that's where we're at. <clears throat> she, you know, she's sophisticated and she's naughty, and so you know that's what makes her so funny and so surprising. But when she walks into a room, she'll find the one person who's taking themselves too seriously and make fun of them, or the you know the one person. Um, you know, who's not taking it seriously enough and like, and single them out. And it just, you could not have a better, you know, really host to bring you into this, this world. And with someone, you know, who's that elegant, we, that, that was the other thing that we always knew was that we can tell some raunchy stories on this show mm -hmm. because the minute it starts to feel a little bit lowbrow, we can cut to a real life princess in a castle, you know, just sort <laughs> of like feeding her swans in her swan moat with mm -hmm. their mini ponies around um, and then, you know, the, the, the other cast are, we're just so on board with, if we're going to do it, like, let's do it right. And they just vowed that they were going to tell their whole stories and the good, the bad and the ugly. And, you know, they, they have their moments and, you know, we do have to, you know, talk to them and, but they really, it, it does come back that they want to make a great show, um, that's something Alex Baskin always says, blood, everyone wants to be on a great show, but do you want to make a great show? Mm -hmm. And that kind of comes back to like, like the, the, really when you're talking about like what you want most, it's like, what are you willing to sacrifice for it? you know, and for them, like, you know, they, they, Kristen always says, I bleed out for this show, you know? And, you know, and, and she does, you know, I mean, if there, if there's something that, you know, might be embarrassing or it might be a little shameful, but it's real, like, it's going on television and you know, they continue to do that. And so like coming from a place like that, I, I think it keeps people coming back. Yeah, for sure. I, I, I just can never get over how lucky we are to have our cast. And obviously you and I have spent countless hours grumbling about them or being frustrated at things that they've done or said or won't say or whatever. But like at the end of the day, they are, they are really, Incredible. <laughs> Incredible. And, and what I hope that they know is that we spend... Oh, they're all listening to this, by the way. I guarantee you. The fact that you're on this, they are 100%. Every cast member is listening right now. Hi, Stassi, Jax, Brittany. Jax might not know how to listen to podcasts, but everyone else is listening. I think I lost them at the History Channel. <laughs> <laughs> they, I, I hope that they know that we spend more time talking about just how hilarious Tom Schwartz is, yeah. you know, or, you know, just, you know, how brave Jax Taylor is and, you know, how we admire, you know, Tom Sandoval's commitment to everything. I, this is a mistake to start this because now I'm going to leave a couple people out. And, uh, and <laughs> no, all of them. We, we talk, we love our cast. We talk about them 
all day, every day. We tell stories about them. We do impressions of them. Uh, we, yeah, they, they are one, they're a wonderful, wonderful cast. Um, and I, it's, it's funny because I, I think that like our cast probably has like this idea that uh, you and other people like sit around and like just like sharpen knives in your office about like how to tell the most like painful how to just like like and and i don't think that's true like we don't think we don't sit around and talk about like how can we make these people look like fools how can we make uh these people just look despicable that's not how it works right no and that probably is my biggest regret and the one thing that i wish that we could do more of is that the you know we every story is in some way conflict but conflict does not mean flipping tables and throwing wine in people's faces and you know we're at a point where people on a reality show have called each other every single word that you can think of that isn't new you know that isn't exciting and you know when people are fighting just for the sake of fighting you know we've had that on we've had we I would say we've shot that before we didn't put it on TV because that's boring to us. You know, what is interesting is people who really care about something and seeing how they go for it. But, you know, there are moments that, um, you know, I wish we could get more of. And probably this is maybe the third big thing I would say about why the show is still on is that this cast is one another's family. Yeah. And that was what, you know, the, other than Sheena, no one's, you know, from out here. And so they really are a family and they're together all the time. And just little things that like when Katie, Kristen and Stasi, you know, would go on trips and stuff, you know, they'd be like, all right, you know, your bed's here, your bed's here, your bed's here. Oh, no, that we three to a bed, just like <laughs> sisters, you know, that, that that's where they would be. That if, you know, one of them was having a bad day, or a bad night, they know that they can pick up the phone at 3.45 in the morning and the other person's going to pick it up and go, yeah, I'm on my way, coming over. We'll, you know, we'll, we'll pour, open a bottle of wine and a you know, box of ice cream and like, let's, let's talk this out. We're going to get through this. And that to me is, you know, that, those, are, those are stories that we could tell. So, you know, I, 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 it, I really resist the idea that like, you know, we don't want them to fight. If you are fighting... Oh my God! We're gonna tell that story. Right. We're gonna make a. I'm gonna make a whole hour out of it, and we're gonna sell it to advertisers like it's going on TV. And I think they know that at this point. But you know, in terms of how people resolve conflict, you know, like I think about like um, like Friday Night Lights. Like that couple had conflict, but they were the greatest couple in the world. But you, they did it so well, and you were just there with them and seeing like how these people, you know, who were flawed but loved each other, you know, made it through tough times. And to me, those stories are just as interesting as a table flip. Yeah. But we do televise the table flips too. For sure. Yeah. Um, all right. So in advance of this podcast, Bill, I did reach out to uh, some of the other producers and also some of the cast members of Vanderpump Rules. And I asked them if they had any questions for you. Uh, and a lot of people responded. A lot of people are excited to to hear you tell your story and talk about this. So I'm going to go through some some questions now, and we can go we can go like a little more rapid fire here. Um, so Jess Snavely, our uh, our awesome production manager, uh, and we've we've touched on this a little bit, but she wants to know what you look for when you're hiring people. Because obviously history has shown that you you hire good people that tend to do good jobs and stay on the show for long times. Because I don't know, pe- people may not know this that listen, but like a lot, a large percentage of the people that we have on the show have been around since season one or season two, and people just tend to stay on the show. So, what do you think is the number one thing that you look for when you hire people? So, when you're meeting someone, let's say they're director of photography, right? So their job is going to be to make the show look beautiful, to handle all the most technical aspects and, you know, talk about, you know, F-stops and apertures, right? But also their job is to ride around in vans. 
with people in the hot summer. <laughs> long right? van rides. That's production is a lot of long van rides. Right. And I mean, you know, this way, the sound that people make when they eat that, you know, you know what they're like when they're, you know, how they smell and the, you know, it's, you get to know these people. And in order to do the job, you kind of have to do both things well, you know, and that a crew for it to gel and really wake up and go, how are we going to make it great today? Um, you know, you have to have a personality, you know, so like, you know, talking about like a Sun de Graf or someone like mm-hmm. that, right? You know, that's going to be a producer who's highly skilled and, you know, and has a take on things. But also, um, you know, she's going to be the kind of personality that a crew, you know, looks forward to coming to work and seeing in the morning and, you know, is just as happy at the end of a 13, 14, 15 hour day, you know, to be to be working with her. So we we keep that in mind, too, that it's not just about running audio or, you know, holding a camera. It's about how do you interact with people? Yeah. Um, I was actually just uh, talking today to Jason, our director of photography, and, and Carter, Chris Carter, one of our longtime operators. And we were just like, like telling stories and laughing from like, oh, God, remember when we were in? Cabo San Lucas in 2013 season two and we we all uh went to that bar after we read you know and then or like oh Vegas in season four I ran you guys were shooting and I was sneaking through the background like trying not to be seen because I was I was on the day crew so I was out you know just like and the stories we tell I mean it's like it's it's like family you know it's like close friends and family so you I mean Clearly, Here's a, a quick job. story about Jason, because I'd love that guy. I love Jason. So th- I met him at the History Channel, and we were traveling through Europe together for mm-hmm. like four weeks of just bone grinding hours. I mean, it was so hard. And at the end of the trip, um, we, um, yeah, Toby and Jason were the shooters. So yeah. at the end of the trip, uh, no one slept in four weeks. They go out for a few very well-deserved cocktails and call time to head to the airport the next day. Let's say it's 5.45 a.m. So just misery in the van. And it could have been a really awful, terrible van ride. Mm -hmm. Talking about this, right? Um, But for Jason, just as funny as he is, just turn the whole thing into... a, uh, into begging for death. It was, he was just, he was pleading for a mercy killing to take him out of his hungover misery. And then, you know, people were like, okay, Jason, you know, and he's got everybody laughing and it would go off. And then he would kind of interrupt and go, hold on. I just want to really lock this down. Cause I don't feel like we're a hundred percent clear on who's going to murder me. And, you know, they show up at the airport and every now all of a sudden it's been this like fun, funny, trip you know because jason's just as charismatic a, you know and as a leader as he is you know and now so geez that's a guy now i've known him you know nine years or something like that and you know he's got this amazing team of people who would follow him anywhere yeah but you know it's more than just being able to operate the camera right exactly um all right michaela farron who's one of our talent producers she wanted you to talk about the book that you wrote when you worked on the hills uh, and why you did it under a female pen name. <laughs> I did it under my stripper name, <laughs> which is my childhood pet in the street I grew up in. So you could find it on Amazon. Um, I think it has two stars. Uh, it's called Lessons in Love by Lila Stort. And uh, yeah, I don't really have a story or like a, a takeaway from that other than that you know, you, you get in where you fit in. You know, the one thing that they really needed over there was like, uh, you know, a nerdy writer who, you know, read grammar books for pleasure so that when something came up and they were going to pitch, you know, a special in Paris or a spinoff, that is what got me in the room, right? It's like, I'm not writing this. I'm not writing this. All right, Langworthy, come in, you know, bring your computer. Um, and so, that, you know, I, I, re- that, I mean, I guess that is the takeaway, right? Find, like, kind of look around, right? And find the thing that nobody else wants to do, right? And it's like, all right, I'll sit here and, you know, quadruple proofread this for split infinitives because none of you guys are going to do that. But that, that means, like, now all of a sudden, like, you know, I'm the first one to know about the spinoff, right? It means I'm in the room, like, that, like, oh, you know, we're, yeah, we're going to Paris. Um, and, you know, one of those things was, like, can we do, um, you know, book about the hill. So it was a nice little side hustle for me. I just thought that, um, like gossipy dating advice would probably 
come better if you thought you were hearing it from a from a girl. I don't know if I'm really the guy you turn to for that. <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, Lindsay Burr, one of our uh, supervising producers who runs uh, one of our crews, she asks, how do you think you've evolved as a producer through the years? I just think that the the here's the biggest thing is that when I don't get the scene I want, I try to want the scene that we got. And so really... Like we, we try to just, it might not be what we expected, but we try to find the most fascinating truth as to what happened. Um, and so sometimes that can be a little harder in the storytelling, right? You know, someone is mad at their boyfriend goes in and, you know, um, slaps him in the face. Like that's a pretty easy story to tell, but you might have to go a few more layers, you know, when you're telling a story of someone who may not fully understand themselves, why they made the decisions that they, that they did. Um, so, you know, it's a little bit, it, it takes more work for the story team. Um, and it may not always be as immediately explosive, but I do think that those stories resonate with people. Very good. Stasi Schroeder, one of our cast members. What is your all time favorite Vanderpump rule scene? I remember when we saw Tom Schwartz propose to Katie. And by the way, I begged him not to do it that way. I was like, <laughs> you're going to mess this up, buddy. You, ha- you are at, this is a slam dunk. Just get down on the knee, man. Make it simple, man. Don't like with the misdirect and everything. Hand her the rock, man. You already won. You already won. Um, and he was like, no, no, no. There's going to be a violinist. There's going to be actors. There's going to be a ruse. But that to see that and what it meant to them to have been with them for so long to, you know, this was like, a, you know, this was a moment, you know, this was lightning in a bottle. This is like something that they'll never forget, you know, that they were always looking for, you know, change in the scene. And it, it, that could just be that, you know, they're cool with this person and now they're mad at them. They were mad. Now they've reconciled, but you, the biggest ones, right. is like you go in, you're single and you come out and you're engaged. I mean, that mm-hmm. that's a massive thing. And, you know, the, um, the, I would be walking around the office and editors would be walking around, um, wiping tears from their eyes. I'm like, what's wrong? Like, oh, I just watched Schwartz propose to Katie. And I remember when we saw the first one, I just said, the first cut of, I said, I'm very happy with this. I don't want to change a frame of it unless we have to. And it's going to be a discussion. It's perfect. Leave it just like this. Did you cry when you watched it? It was dusty in there. It was a little dusty in there. <laughs> no, that's a really sweet moment. Um, is there? Are there any scenes that make you, this is another Stasi question, any scenes that you have watched back and make you cringe or you wish that would be better or you could have done differently? One time I definitely could do better was a Stasi scene. Oh, okay. And, She'll like to hear this. And it was that... Uh, it was beginning of season six. So this, here's the story. Sheena goes up to Katie and says, hey, it's my birthday, having a big party. And I would really, really love it if you didn't come because I don't like you. I mean, it was like that, like point blank. Don't, you're not invited to my party. You can't come. I don't like you. So then the next scene is um, Schwartz and Stasi and Katie. And they're at dinner. And Schwartz gets up to excuse himself. Like, oh, where are you going, Schwartz? Oh, to Sheena's birthday party. And the last thing we shot with um, uh, Schwartz and Katie, their wedding, right? <laughs> so his new wife has got a vowed enemy. I don't like you. Um, and Schwartz uh, is going with a gift. <laughs> and no one no one bats an eye, right? Of just like, there's no comment on it. So we need a you know an interview bite from Stasi, And we, for whatever reason, we don't have it. And... I swear what I did not know was that um, we had asked her this already. So all we need her to say is like, this is really weird. So, and we really don't do this, but like the cuts going out and I don't know why we don't just have her commenting on the fact that this very weird thing is very weird. Um, So there's, we, there's something else that she said it's weird as F. And so we're like, all right, I guess, you know, just, just, put it in. And it didn't feel like we're making some big leap here. Um, what I did not know was that you had asked her that. And <laughs> yeah. she had said, 
the reason we didn't have it was because she didn't think it was weird at all. Right. She just thought that would be a normal thing for right. a husband to do, which I still don't understand. Um, I can really say we don't do that. We would ne- when someone says, you know, I don't feel this way, we'd never make them say, I feel this way. And we learned later. But um, I'm sorry, Stasi. I should have checked. I need to do better. That's my bad. And I apologize. That, uh, yeah, I think we'd asked her multiple times. And I was like, Stasi, can you just, I mean, admit it. It is kind of weird. And she was so adamant about it. She's like, not in this group. That is, in this group, totally normal. I will not say that like she was drawn a line in the sand so then when i saw the cut where she oh. said she goes it's weird af or whatever she says i was just like oh god and of course as soon as it airs she's like texting me she's like you son of a bitch and i have to sit like you know some shows like they look through every question and use whatever like and we really don't like we look you know we ask them that question this is how they feel that's kind of what i was getting at before like you know, we could have done something with that if I'd known, you know, all right, let's talk about why that's not weird. Let's talk right. about why when someone says to your wife, I hate you, the husband should definitely go gift shopping for that person. <laughs> like, and that would have been interesting. Um, you know, more interesting than a just a little silly bite of it. It's weird AF. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it was it, it was an honest mistake. So I, I hope she'll forgive me. <laughs> uh, all right. Tom Schwartz. He wants to know, <laughs> what's the most annoyed you've ever been while filming Vanderpump Rules? Okay. That, so the When he wrote me annoying, that, I was like, what if it's a, at, at me? Like, what if the most annoyed you've been on the show is at me? Like, Jeremiah just, like, didn't bring home the goods that one day. And, but Yeah. Um, well, you're in luck. Because <laughs> it's not about you. Yeah. It is about Tom Schwartz. Oh, really? Oh, perfect. Yeah. So... Season one, we're going to Vegas, and it's we're only like three weeks into production. It was like pretty early in the season, and the deal we had with the Hard Rock because they had done a production, they had done a show already um, with another company, and they got burned by them. They said you guys can't do anything illegal the whole time you're in the city of Las Vegas, and if you do, we can take this footage and you know not let you air it. So I had a big talk with everybody. We can't break any rules. We got to be on our best behavior here. This is not the time to push boundaries. So cut to two hours later, Jax Taylor is ripping his chunky sweater off at this Moroccan restaurant, <laughs> throwing stools. Um, drinks are getting tossed. Stassi's throwing drinks in Tom Schwartz's face. You know, people are crying. Um, now Sandoval's got his shirt off. That guy Frank has his shirt off, sprinting through the parking lot. In my mind, we may as well just start posting our resumes and looking for new jobs because (laughs) we're going to get arrested. The hard rock's not going to let us use the footage. Bravo has not seen a frame of any episode. We have not sent rough cut one of one Oh one to them yet. And just what else would they say? But you know, we just, we made a big mistake. We believed in you. Mm -hmm. And obviously you guys are not, you know, fit for it. And I don't really actually think of it like that. I think that it's like you, Bill Langworthy, are not fit for this. Right. I, at this point, I do not know that it's going to be the centerpiece of our season, <laughs> right. that it's going to be in every super tease, which is why I and you are running through the footage like idiots. Yeah. 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 No, then the owner was like, you guys get the fuck off my property. I'm calling the police. Like it was like we weren't like. We were like twisting our mustaches at that point, being like, we got it. It was like, no, we, we're we going to get shut down and go to jail. Let's please leave. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah, no, and we're in the... In the yeah, code red, code red, load up the vans. <laughs> the, yeah, we're not high-fiving, thinking like we're, we're bringing it home. Um, but I, I remember, and it was one of those things of like, it was exactly what I told them not to do. And uh, Schwartz, you know, who really is, you know, so big hearted and really, you know, he just wants everyone to, to, you know, have a good time, could tell that I was suffering. And he came up to me and said, but do you still love us, Bill? <laughs> and I looked him dead in the eyes and I said, no, I don't, Tom. No, I don't. <laughs> I thought you were going to say talk about the time where you tried to get him to tell Katie implied El Carmen that he had a tequila tasting to go to. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> and just was so drunk and uh, sleep deprived that he just literally could not say the words. And you were in his room for like 45 minutes. Tom, just say, I have to go to a tequila tasting. 
and the word just never came out. Yeah, you said a tequila tasting, and uh, <laughs> we end up not being able to show the tequila tasting <laughs> because Tom Schwartz could not speak English that day. Um, all right, uh, Ariana Maddox. Uh, what What's the biggest difference between The Hills and Vanderpump Rules? The biggest difference was that we had to bring the party to the cast of The Hills, whereas Vanderpump Rules cast is the party. Wherever they go, they're they have the best time. They are the kids in the room having the most fun. And I think that that really comes across on screen. I love that. Uh, what's your favorite season of the show and why? I'll put season two of Vanderpump Rules up against any season on on any show yeah it just is like such a complete story and it's so active and there is a question that's raised you know what everybody wants in every single scene they are dynamic they're they're making choices and then it pays off in like the final 30 seconds of the season and i just feel like that's like where we're at our best that's what i want you know every every season to be like yeah it was a good season um is there anything that you wish you could change about the production of vanderpump rules but can't yeah i wish i wish we could shoot 24 hours i wish that (laughs) we never had to wake up and go god this really fascinating thing happened at five in the morning and to be honest um you know you guys can thank Ariana next year. I'm like working on it right now. Like we're thinking about ways that we might actually be able to do it. So, you know, when we're, um, you know, shooting compelling content with you guys at 6am, um, on day four of the trip next year, um, you can thank Ariana for the inspiration there. <laughs> but the, I mean, the other one, the, honestly, the, the scenes that I, I what I'm kind of talking about, there are fights that we miss. Mm-hmm. What I actually wish that we got that we don't have is like, that like I was having a real tough time and I just like knew I would call, you know, Katie and Stasi and like to come over at four in the morning and like eat ice cream with me and watch the notebook and like that they would do that, you know, mm-hmm. that like those are the scenes I really wish we had. Yeah. Uh, it's funny because the cast themselves, uh, ha- a lot of them have said like, man, you guys just um, you shouldn't rap. Like, why do you got to stop? I mean, at 11, like you, you guys know we get best things happen at late at night. Like, why do you go, why do you ever go home? Uh, we, I would love to like record them saying that and then play it back to them at four in the morning when they're like, why the fuck are you still here? <laughs> um, and Ariana's last question was, what's your favorite thing about Ariana? <laughs> also, LOL. She tagged that with LOL. So it, The best thing about Ariana is that she's a hard laugh. But if you get her to laugh, then you know that it's actually funny. Oh, she, but she has a great laugh, but she doesn't suffer fools. And she's, I don't think it's like a sympathy laugher, yeah. right? So like if, if you, she, and she likes to be amused. Not everything amuses her, but so make, making her laugh, you're like, all right, that was like pretty good. Oh, she's, she'll love to hear that. Um, all right, Tom Sandoval. <laughs> uh, he wants to know, there, is, uh, there have been rumors in the past and even articles written about it uh, that on the hills, Kristen Cavallari said that producers bribed other cast members with designer bags. Okay, I've heard. I have heard this one. Yeah. Before. So he, I think he's just he he. To be frank, thought it was you. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. That definitely was not me. Um, I've never bought anyone a designer bag. I can I can say that. Um, and I don't think that would have been my approach. Um, I have heard that story before. So it's it seems like that that is something that may have gone down. Um, what I guess I would just sort of say, um, cause I really don't want to have my phone start pinging with, um, you know, Chris and Sheena, Stasi, Katie, Ariana and Lala asking for designer bags, um, that when you get there, you, you're not in a great space, right? Like, you know, you should be doing it because you want to share your most fascinating truth with the world and tell the story of your experience. Um, and you know, it shouldn't be for accessories, um, so no, we, we are, um, you know, too pure. We're above that. Um, and there will be no designer bags in season eight. <laughs> Get it straight ladies. And then Sandoval is also curious, uh, cause he's heard that you, uh, play the piano. Is that true? Uh, that is true. Um, not exactly sure how it pertains to this, but the one thing, you know, that I do think is interesting is you, you do, 
it is amazing how you use everything you ever learned, right? I mean, it, sometimes it feels like every book you ever read or anything you ever did somehow comes into play. Um, and so, you know, that, uh, that all, um, every day, you know, you use some part of it. I don't know, really know what Sandoval's driving for there, but I, I think um, he just wants to like hear you say that you play the piano and maybe like how that came about. Did, I don't think, I don't think Sandoval is looking for like the deeper, uh, experiential meaning of, and how you apply piano to Vanderpump rules. I think he's just like, cool. You're a musician, bro. Cool. Yes. <laughs> he actually, his, his, entire pitch was that I should borrow a keyboard, a high quality one, his words, but if I don't have one myself, borrow it, hide it wherever I'm interviewing you. I'm not joking. This was his idea. Cover it with a blanket. And then when we got to this portion of the interview, reveal it to you and ask you to play something on the spot. So I, maybe what this gets to is why these people are still, you know, so fascinating <laughs> to me because that would be, my last inclination. That would be my, my, the furthest thing that I would think about doing. Um, and I think, you know, it's this sort of like awe and admiration I have for these people, you know, who live out loud and are, you know, are happiest when the spotlight is on them. And I've, you know, I've just never been that person. Yeah. And even, you know, it's something like, you know, for me, you know, music is a very solitary pursuit. Um, and the behind the scenes has always been where I'm most comfortable. But you were like a, a performing jazz pianist in high school and college, right? No, no, but I did used to play in bands. That, that's the same thing. But I played the bass in bands. Oh, okay. But the, you know, that's basically like being a producer, right? Like you're in the band, but you're not, I mean, you're like kind of in the band, <laughs> but you know, the, the, it is funny to think back on that, right? Was that, you know, I was the guy who set up the gigs, who wrote the lyrics, right? Cause that's like, you know, a little bit tedious, who was going to sit down and actually put pen to paper and come up with it. Um, you know, who would like make the set list and that sort of thing, make sure and really like produce it. Right. Of just sort of like, you know, that's like a really interesting seven minute jazz solo that you played, but I don't think that that's what the girls want to hear. So like, here are some songs that they can dance to. Like here are some songs we'll play when they go in the other room to get them back in, um, was just always the way I thought. And it still is now. That's funny. All right. Just a couple more questions. Um, where, where where do we go from here? Where do you think Vanderpump Rules goes from here? Where would you like to see it go from here? The, so to me, the perfect world is, you know, we know these people so well. I really do think that when people turn it on, you know, it goes a little beyond watching a TV show. I think they're like hanging out with their friends. And, you know, that to me, that makes all the sense in the world um, because rather than turn on, a scripted show where you get to watch someone pretend to be a doctor, right? Like you can like tune in, you know, and watch the real La La Kent, you know, just be La La in the way that, that nobody else can. And as we move into different chapters of their life, it, it's get the stakes are higher and it's getting bigger. I mean, you know, this is like, you know, let's talk about your first home. Let's talk about getting married and engaged. You know, we're going to have Vander kids at some point, which mm-hmm. will be unbelievable. And, the you know the the cast like they they really like they are like they're genuine and they're honest and they're the same people that we started making the show with seven years ago and I don't know why we're so lucky but they are and if they can be just as honest and forthcoming and dedicated to this weird social experiment and this odd job that only a few people in the history of the universe have had as they go into these things. You know, I think we can go on forever. I love that. Uh, so to bring it back to, you know, work and production, product, the production side of things, um, I love asking everyone on this podcast and i um, curious to hear what you have to say. But what, what advice would you give to people that want to do what, what we do? You want to work in reality TV? You want to produce? Like, what's, what, what's the path to that? So make something. So what, whatever it is, so go and make a 60 second film on your iPhone, you know, get into a film collective and make a short film every month like I used to do. Um, and then, you know, put your resume out there. Uh, there's no job that's too small. 
when you go in there, you know, be the most interesting person in the room, right? And talk about the, you know, the films you make on your iPhone, like talk about, you know, that that you're out there waiting for making it happen. You're not waiting for it, right? And I think that that's the big thing, right? Never wait for permission, right? You know, if you're a creator, then great. Like take your phone out of your pocket and you can start there. Do your next one on a camera, do your next one with two cameras. Um, so I think, I think that that is probably, uh, the, the best thing, you know, for anything that you want to do that I always think of it is like, you know, don't be the person who's asking, you know, do me this favor and will you choose me? And can you invest in me? Be the person who's already got something going and, you know, do you want to hitch your wagon to this? Mm, That's awesome. Well, Bill, thank you so much for taking the time to do this. I really appreciate it. Um, and I will, uh, I'll see you at work tomorrow. Yeah. Listen, and I hope I see you at work for many, many (laughs) tomorrows after, after this, I, I I just have to tell you one more time. Um, this podcast is great just as everything you do is, um, it has been a a real pleasure and, uh, I'm glad that I was so persistent and that I did not let something as small as the birth of your first child (laughs) interfere with getting the field producer that I wanted. Cause I, I just, I, I think you're the greatest. So thank you, Jeremiah Smith. Thank you so much. And now uh, to finish this off, Bill will be playing the Vanderpump rules theme song on the piano. Go ahead, Bill. I'm looking for the no. stop button no. over there. <laughs> All right. Thanks. <laughs> All right. That was my conversation with Vanderpump rules showrunner, Bill Langworthy. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you guys so much for listening. It really means a lot to me. Do me a favor, if you haven't already, please go on to iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, Overcast, wherever you're listening to this podcast, and subscribe, rate it, and write a review. It is really helpful to the show. If you want to reach me, I'd really love to hear from you. Shoot me a note. I have an email address. It's show, S-H-O-W, at workingclasshollywood.com. Or find me on Instagram. It's workingclasshollywood. I do have some really exciting guests coming up in the next few weeks, so stay tuned. I hope you guys will tune in. Thank you again, and I will see you next time.